Sechaz Yimam Asaf Samach Veis is about the topic of the mitzvah of Pru or Ravu, the mitzvah on every man to have children. The Gemara is discussing the machlokes between Yisrael and Beishamai as to how many children one must have in order to be able to the mitzvah. The Gemara will bring a machlokes how you explain each of their opinions. The Gemara will have two different versions, two additional versions as to what exactly their machlokes is, an explanation of those opinions. The Gemara will interrupt in the middle with a discussion of the three things that Moshe Rabbeinu was machadish on his own. The Gemara will then go into several Shilas, questions about the mitzvah of Puru. The Gemara wants to know if one fulfills it if he had children before he converted, if he fulfills it if he had children who died in his lifetime, if his grandchildren count, what types of grandchildren. And then the Gemara will get into some Agarata about the mitzvah of Puru and the mitzvah of being married and how important it is for a person to have a wife. So let's begin. The Gemara said there was a Machokas. We saw in our Mishnah between Yisrael and Beishamai. We'll have three versions of this machok. It's according to the first version, which is the version we saw in our Mishnah. Meishamai says you need to have two sons, and Mishnah says you have to have one son and one daughter. So the Lord wants to know, according to this version, what is the source of these two opinions? So the Lord says Meishamai learned their opinion from Moshe Rabbeinu. He had two sons, and then he separated from his wife, and he did not have any more children. So you see that he fulfilled the mitzvah when he had two sons. He did not need to have a daughter at all. That's Meishamai's opinion. His two sons, of course, were Gershom and Eliezer, as it says. Now, Beis Hillel says you need to have a son and a daughter. He learns that, they learn that out of the creation of the world. When the first thing Hashem created to set the world flowing were one man and one woman, Adam and Chava. Hashem created that. That fulfills the mitzvah of populating the world because it all goes from there on their own. The mitzvah of Priru is generally said as Lasheves Yitzara. You have to make the world populated. And just like Hashem made a man and a woman, a person also has to make a man and a woman. Now, why did the ancient not hold of each other's opinions? So Basil said, you learn from creation. Meshama said, you can't learn from creation because there it had to be a man and a woman. There's no other way to get the world running. You need a man and a woman for the world to exist, for children to be able to continue to be created. However, mankind, after that moment, doesn't have to do that. And you cannot learn efshur mi'i efshur. You cannot learn a possible from an impossible. It was impossible to have any other setup in the creation of the world. However, a person's own obligation is possible to be different. Now, according to Beis Hillel, why didn't want to learn from Moshe Rabbeinu? So he, they hold that Moshe Rabbeinu had two children and separated from, had two sons and separated from his wife. That was not an instruction of a country baruch That was something he decided to do on his own, and he cannot apply that to anybody else. Now, the Gemara interrupts here before we continue discussing this Mechokas B'Sel Meishamai. The Gemara discusses the three things which Moshe Rabbeinu was Mechadish on his own. So the Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu was Mechadish three things on his own, it's a price, and HaKadosh Baruch was masking to each of them. What are the three things? One, he separated from his wife. Two, he broke the luchos. And three, he made three days of preparation for Kabbalah Satora. Now, why did he separate from his wife? So the Gemara said he had a drusha for each of these. He separated from his wife because he said, after Mata and Torah, HaKadosh Baruch said, to, well, before Matan and Torah, Hashem said to each person to separate from their wives in order to be ready to accept the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu said, look, if a person, regular Yisrael, has to separate, they only have one specific time, and they know when they're going to have to speak to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and they still have to separate, uh, certainly I have to separate from my wife because I have to be available for HaKadosh Baruch Hu can come speak to me at any time and at any moment, and therefore I have to completely separate at all times. Now, the Gemara says that, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu agreed to that, as it says, when Chai Yisrael left Har Sinai, Hashem said, Shvu lechem aleichem, go back to your wives, but to Moshe, he said, Va'atapayamaynimadi, you stay here with me, meaning don't go back to your wife. So he was the only person in history who was supposed to separate from his wife because of a Baruch Hu's connection with him. Now, the next thing he did was he broke the luchot. So the Gemara says he learned that out of the mitzvah of Karben Pesach. It says that a ben nechar, somebody who serves others, is not allowed to eat from it. And that's only one mitzvah. So Klai which became complete mumrim by the Avera of Cheda Egel, certainly they violated Kalat Kula. Certainly they could not uh, have anything to do with the luchos, which have all of Kalat Kula in it. Uh, if being a mumar makes one not able to fill the mitzvah of carbon Pesach. It certainly means that I cannot have access to the luchos. Now we see that Hakadosh Baruch Hu agreed as Rish Lakish as a Joshua. And the words Asher Shibarta Asher means Yiyasher, as in praiseworthy and straight. So he was saying Asher Shibarta that you broke them Yiyasher Kochach Asher Shibarta. Thank you for breaking them. Straighten your strength because you broke them. It was the right thing to do. 
Now, he returned, he added one day on his own to the three days of preparation for Kabbalah Satara. That was the third thing. How did he understand that he was supposed to do that? It was because an Hashem said that they should separate from their wives in order to prepare for Kabbalah Satara. It says, V'kidash them, you should sanctify yourselves, Hayom and Machar, today and tomorrow. So that links Hayom and Machar, today and tomorrow. Those have to be similar. And just like tomorrow is a full 24-hour period, it's not a missing part. Today should also be a full 24-hour period without a missing part. It should be the day and the night together. However, he had gotten that command during the day already. The night from before was lost. They didn't separate themselves the night before. Therefore, he understood that he's supposed to do two full days of separation, and that has to start from the coming night. So it has to be the coming day and the day afterwards, so that we get two full separating days. Now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu agreed because the Shekhinah did not come until Shabbos, so this happened on Wednesday, and he understood that Thursday and Friday were supposed to be two full 24-hour days. And that was the extra day that he added, and when it indeed worked out that way, the Shekhinah only came for Kabbalah Satora on Shabbos. So these are the three things that Moshe Rabbeinu added on his own. Okay, now back to Machakas Basel Meshamai about the Mitzvah Puravu. We have two different versions of a Bryson in which Rabbi Nassan has a different understanding of what the Machakas is. According to both of these, Meshamai requires more than Beis Hillel does. The question is, which one is going to be the way we had it before? It will be Beis Shammai that says different than we had it before, or Beis Hillel that says different than we had it before. So according to the first version, it's Beis Shammai. According to this, Beishamai holds you have to have two sons and two daughters, a total of four children, and Beishelel says just one son and one daughter. Now, what's the source of Beishamai according to this opinion? Where does he come up with two sons and two daughters? The most it comes from the birth of Shes, after Adam and Chava had Cain and Hevel, and Cain was killed, They had uh, and Cain killed Hevel, then they had Shes, and the expression they used was Shesliyalikim Zera Acher Hashem gave me Shasliyalikim Zera Acher Hashem gave me another child Tachas Hevelki Harogel Kain instead of Hevel because Kain killed him. It means this was a replacement for Hevel. That means a, re- a replacement was required. Had they not had that extra child, then they would not have fulfilled the mitzvah. So that's only for the son. How do you know the daughter? So the one says for each it says S, which shows they had a sister with them. So therefore, their four children that they had to have were Cain and his sister, and Chase and his sister, a total of two boys and two girls. And again, the key point here is that he said that this is a replacement for Hevel, meaning that they were not complete, did not fulfill the mitzvah unless they had a replacement for Hevel. Now, that's according to Beis Shammai, according to Rabbi understanding, Beis Hill uh, says that's, when they said replacement for Hevel, they were not saying that a replacement in order to fulfill the mitzvah, it was just part of their expression of thanking HaKadosh Baruch Hu for replacing what they had lost. Okay, now the third version of this machok is Beis and Beis is a b'risa, different version of the b'risa, where Rabbi Nelson says, Beis says, um, a son and a daughter. And Beis Hillel says a son or a daughter. According to this, Beis Hillel is a machodesh pshat. He says a son or a daughter. You don't have to have both. Where does he get that from? Where do they get that from? So the Gemara explains because the requirement for populating the world is what drives the mitzvah of Pru or Hu. You have to have continued population. So by having one child, you are populating the world. You are fulfilling the mitzvah of uh, populating the world. You don't have to have more than that. Okay, now the Gemara goes into its first Shaila. The Gemara asks if somebody converted from Akam to Yisrael, and he had the children while he was in Akam. So did he fulfill the mitzvah with that or not? Now, interestingly, the Gemara does not consider the possibility that you don't fulfill the mitzvah unless you have children that are Yisrael. The fact that his child is in Akam is not the point. That is that is called populating the world. That's fine. The question is, when the person converted, did he lose his access to that mitzvah because he is not the same person he was before? So the Gemara says, the Machlokas of Yochanan and Rishlakish. Rabbi Yochanan says, look, he fulfilled the mitzvah because he repo- he populated the world. There are children in the world because of him. Rishlakish says, doesn't count because when he converted, he became a new person. He cut on Shinola Adam, he's like a child who was just born, and he doesn't get credit for what he did before he converted, and he has to do the mitzvah over again now. Says so the Gemara, there's another similar machlokas of Yochanan and Rishakish which parallels this. The Gemara is to explain what that is and explain why we need both of them. What's that machlokas? That's somebody who converts, and he has a son 
after his conversion, is that son a Bechar if he had children before he converted? It means he had children when he was a guy, then he converted, now he has a son, is that son a Bechar or not? Does he get the special double portion of Bechar or not? Rabbi Echonen says he does not, because he had children before, and they'll still count as his children. This is not his first child, it's not his racious Oni, it's not his first strength. Rish Lakish says no, well, the children he had before doesn't count, that was from a different life, a different existence. And therefore, this is Katan Shinolad, the son that he has after conversion, is his Bukhar. Okay, now the Gemara discusses why do we need both of these? So the Gemara says each of them um, need to be specified. Because it makes more sense that the mitzvah of Pru or Ravu is fulfilled by children that one had before he converts. And that's because those are populating the world. The mitzvah is to populate the world. And you are doing that just because. Rav Yochanan holds there that that counts as if he did. The mitzvah does not mean that he holds that those children also count as inheritors, because they do not inherit. They're not part of the nachla. Therefore, we need a Rav Yochanan to say, if we would have only had the case of Pruravu that Rav Yochanan holds there, that they count, we would not know that he would say the same thing in the case of nachla. So that's why, according to Rav Yochanan, you need both cases. Now, according to Rish Lakish, you need the other case, because if you only show that Rish Lakish holds that it does not count in the case of Nachla, you would not know what Rish Lakish is in the case of Pru-Ravu. Maybe there he agrees that it counts as if they had, as if, as though he had children because he did, and those children count. Therefore, you have to say both cases. Okay, now the Gemara is going to start bringing proofs to which side is correct. So the Gemara first discusses a proof that Rav Yochanan brought to Reish Lakish, and that's, we see that in amongst the Akam, nations of the world, people are considered to be the son of one another. You cannot say that a son of an Akam is not counted as his son, and therefore the son of the Ger that he had before he converted should also count as his son. We really see that Akams do have sons that are Mesiaches to them. So he quotes a Pasuk in Melachim, talking about where the king Baradach Bladan ben Bladan sent gifts to Chizkiyo when he became ill. So you see it refers to Barodach Bladan as the son of Bladan. So you see, therefore, that he did have children. He is considered to be a son. So uh, that shows that the child of Anachim is considered his child. So the Gemara says, the Rish Lakish says, that's not a proof. That's talking about while one is Anachim. Started as Anachim, stayed Anachim. While he's Anachim, his children are his. However, once he converts, now he's a Katan Shinolot. Now the children he had before no longer count. So that is not relevant to our issue uh, over here. Now, the Gemara quotes in a similar statement, one made by Rav. Rav says, if you're talking about an Eved, everybody agrees the children of an Eved don't count. The, the, the children that an Eved have are not considered to be Mesiaches to him. Here you see that Rish Lakish said that an Akam's children are Mesiaches to him until he converts, but an Eved certainly his children are not Mesiaches to him. They don't count as his own. Where do you see that? So about Eliezer, Eliezer Eved Avram, it says about him, Shulachem Paul Yem Achamar, Avram told him to stay here with the donkey, so you see, it's Amadom al Khamar, is similar to a donkey, in the sense at least that his children are just considered to be offspring, not counted as his son. So, Razakash on that, Raz says that Siva, Siva was an Eved um, in the times of David Hamalch, he was an Eved of Mifi Vaishes, and the Apostle clearly lists Siva as having children. It says, He had 15 children and 20 servants. So the Gemara says, you, therefore, you clearly see that an Eved does have children. The Gemara answers, the Rechab Yaakov says, no, that's just talking children just to show that they descended one from the other, just as you would say about livestock. Like the Torah says, par ben vakar. They could have a cow descended from a bull. That's one thing that's not saying that they're misyaches. As a child, it's just showing that one came from the other in biological descent. <clears throat> so therefore, that's not a proof. So the Gemara says, well, if that's true, so then why don't you say the same thing about Bladan ben Bladan? Give the same answer there and just say that they are just biologically children. It's not showing that they are. Why well, do have to say that? No, that's different because they were still Akam. While they're Akam, they are considered to be a son. Why don't you just say it's biological descent, like Kipar ben Vakar? The Gemara says, no, no, no. But Kipar ben Bakar, over here where it says that Siva had 15 
Bonim. There it just says children were born. So that could just mean children were born. You don't have them listing his name as this one, the son of that one. Here it said Bladan Ben Bladan, Barodach Bladan Ben Bladan. Lists his name as that. Clearly has to be that he's considered to be his child. Also, you find elsewhere it actually goes back to the grandfather. Um, like it says, Asa ben Hadad ben Tavrimod ben Chizoyon Melcharom. So it gives three generations or all Misaches together. So it's like Yoshev be Damasek. They're all considered together. So there is a clear line of descent there. Okay, now the brings the second Machlokis on the topic. It's really the third for now on the topic of Pruravu. And that is the question of if somebody has children and they die, does that count as if you filled the mitzvah of Puravu or not? Says the Gemara, that is a machokis between Rav Huna and Rav Yechanan. Rav Huna says if one has children and they died in his lifetime, he does fulfill the mitzvah of Puravu, and Rav Yechanan says he does not. Now, Rav Yechanan says he does not because he did not populate the world. He leaves the world as empty as he found it. Rav Huna says, though, he did because there's a different Indian, and that is all neshamas have to be born before Mashiach can come. By bringing a neshama into the world, he did bring us closer to the time of Mashiach. He, he did move the world along toward its fulfillment, even though he did not leave more people in the world. He did remove neshamos from the storehouse of neshamos called guf, where they have to be brought. Now the Gemara wants to bring a proof on the subject. The Gemara says there is a brace that says b'nei banim harayim kibanim grandchildren count as children as far as the lach of pruravu. So the Gemara assumes that that means that the grandchild counts as a child. So that if he had a son and the son died, but the son left over another son, so that counts as a son. That means that the son himself doesn't count because he died. So that clearly shows that the son who died does not count as a son. Reason, that's not necessarily what it means. It just means that it helps that the grandson counts to fulfill the numbers. So let's say he had a daughter who gave birth to a son. That would count as a son and a daughter. That would count as if he had two of them. So in the opinion of Beis Hillel, he fulfilled the mitzvah. Now the Gemara quotes a brisa that shows this is clearly not the pshat. The brisa says explicitly, B'nei banim harim kibanim, grandchildren count as your children, so that if one of them died or alternatively doesn't count as proof because he himself was barren and could not continue, so there is um, no pru or revu in a circumstance like that. So there you clearly see it says straight up that if a son had died, it does not count as a child. Clear rejection of Ravuna's position. You want to leave it at that. Okay. Now, as far as the subject of B'nai Banam, Harim Kibanam, a grandchild, counts as a child, so Abaye understood that that means that if a son, that a son counts as a replacement for, that a grandson counts as a son. So let's say if he had a son and then a son. So the grandson replaces the son who died. If he had a daughter who had a daughter and then the, the mother died, so the granddaughter counts as having had a daughter. Uh, if he had a son who had a daughter, so there's a machlok as Abaye and Rabban, according to the Gro, if he had a daughter who had a son, the same machlok as there applies. No, it would be because he didn't have a son, because his son didn't leave another son over. His son just left a daughter. His son himself died without a children. Or if he had a daughter and the daughter just gave birth to a son, it doesn't count as if he had a daughter in the world. So the Gemara there says that that is, therefore, it's a machok between Mesil, uh, between Rav and Abaye, if that counts as fulfilling the uh, mitzvah or not. Abai held that it did not count. Rava held that it count. Rava said, listen, he fulfilled the world. He did increase the population of the world. It's L'Sheva Sitzaro. It, it, it increased the inhabitation of the world. Okay. So now the Gemara says, though, that if one child has two children, that doesn't count as two children for the grandfather. So if, well, let's say, Avram had Yitzchak, and Yitzchak had a son and a daughter, it just counts as one son for Avram. It doesn't count as two. You can't count both of them. Where says, is that true? Well, we have a question on that. That's because the Rabbana and Setar of Sheshes that he should uh, get married and have children. And he said to them, but I already have a grandson and a granddaughter from my son. He had a son and he had a grandson and a granddaughter from that child. So that counts. So he was clearly saying that my two grandchildren count as mine. And therefore it's enough, even though he himself had only one child. So that proves that it works. The Gemara says no. He wasn't really. He doesn't really hold it. That works. He was just trying to push them away. And the real reason he didn't marry and have children is because he couldn't. He had become 
unable to have more children because he had held himself in. And where it says he was one of those who went to the shear of Ravuna, which went overly long, and he needed to use the restroom because he held it in. He therefore ended up wounded and injured, and he was not able to have children afterwards. Finishing off the topic of B'nai Banim Harim, Kibanim, grandchildren counting as children, Yimar says, what is the source of that halacha? Yimar offers two sources. Yimar's first source is from Lavan. Lavan referring to Yaakov's children, who are his grandchildren, said, Habanos Benosai, the daughters are my daughters, Habanim Banai, and the sons are my sons. So therefore, he's clearly showing that grandchildren count as children. Yimar says, well, if you're going to take that literally, then when he says, Vatsayin Tsayini, the sheep are my sheep, does he mean to say that I give birth to those sheep? Obviously, that doesn't make sense. So what he just means to say is that the sheep are mine because you got them from me. So the children, he also means to say the children are mine because you got them from me. So that's not a good source. Samar therefore looks for a different source. Samar says it's from the Psukim discussing who had the Mechokikim, who gave birth to the Mechokikim. We have one Pasuk in Adir Yamim that says, V'achar b'chetzon el beis machar avi gilad v'teilid lo es siguv. So... Machir is the father of Gilad. Then it says, Mini Machir Yadu Machikikim. And Machir gave birth to the Machokikim. But then it says, Yehuda Machikiki. The Yehuda is my Machokik. And Yehuda was born here from Chetzron. Chetzron was the son in law of Machir, as we said, Bo Chetzron El Beis Machir. So, how then is he considered to be a son of Machir that we say that the Machokik came from Machir? So you've got to say what it means is that even though he was the son of the daughter, that this Mechoki was the son of the daughter and of Chetzron, the children of Machir, it still counts as a children, as a child of Machir himself. And therefore that shows that Bani Bonim Hareheim Kivonim. And now refers back to our Mishnah. We've seen in our Mishnah that a person should not separate from his wife if unless he has already fulfilled the mitzvah of Purunavu. That implies that had he fulfilled the mitzvah of Purunavu, he can. Mar says that's different than what Rabbi Shua says, because Rabbi Shua says in a price that a person should never stop having children, he should always continue. He says if somebody is married to a woman when he's young, he should marry when he's old. We shouldn't say it's enough. I was married when I was young. If he had children when he was young, he should continue having children when he's older. As the Pesach says, Baboker Zer Zerachol, Erevat Tanach Yedacha, in the morning, sow your grain, your seed, and in the evening, meaning towards old age, don't stop. What's the reason? Because you don't know which one will work out well. You don't know which children will be kosher, which children will be proper, which one will be fulfilling. And therefore, you gotta keep on working, don't stop. And more than that, so what's what happened with Rabbi Kiva? Rabbi Akiva said uh, he learned, Rabbi Akiva said one should learn a lot of Torah in his young age, continue to learn in his old age, because if he had Talmidim in his young age, he should continue raising Talmidim even in his old age. Also from Baboker, Zara Zarecha. And we say, based on that, that Rabbi Akiva experienced this himself. He had 12,000 pairs of Talmidim, 24,000 Talmidim, from the city of Geves until Antiphras, and they all died at once. They all died within one period from Pesach till Atzeres, between Pesach and Shuas, for the reason that they were not properly respectful to each other. And that shows that one can have lots of Talmidim, and you never know if it's going to be enough. The world was then empty of Torah. Nobody knew scholarship until Rabbi Kiva came to Rabbi Senu Sheba. Darom, our teachers who are in the south, and he taught them. They are Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yasi, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Lazar ben Shimbua. They are those who created the world of Torah, which we have today. Now, Rabbi Chama Bar Abba said, the name of, uh, or uh, possibly Rabbi Chia Bar Avin is the one who said, they all died a very terrible death. And Rav Nachman explains that that is the disease called Ascara, which Gemara describes elsewhere as being particularly horrible. As far as the statement of Rabbi Shua, that one should stay married or continue to marry, even if he has already been married in his youth, and he has had the children, the Gemara says, Rav Masna says, that is the halacha. The halacha is like Rabbi Shua. Now the Gemara goes into some Megadita about the importance of having a wife. Says, in the name of Eli, anybody who does not have a wife is bereft of simcha, joy, bracha, blessing, and a tova, goodness, doesn't have any of those three things. Where do you see that he has no simcha? As it says, You should be happy, you and your beisacha, you and your house. If you have a house, you have a wife, beisacha always means your wife, then you have simcha. 
He's devoid of bracha, as it says, l'haniach bracha el beisecha. That it's your beisecha, again, your first year wife, that brings bracha. But l'tova, it doesn't have goodness, as it says, l'tova, yes, it's not good if a person's alone. Now the Gemara adds, Ben Marava, and Eretz Yisrael used to say he's also below Torah and below Choma. He doesn't have Torah and he doesn't have protection, he doesn't have a wall. He doesn't have Torah because it says, I don't have my Ezra, I don't have my wife with me, and then Toshia, which is a Torah, is pushed away from me. And below Choma, without a wall, as it says, Nekeva to Soviv Gever, a female surrounds the male and provides a wall for him. It says Rava Bar Ulo is also below Shalom. He also doesn't have peace because it says Vida Taki Shalom Ahalacha. Ufokadita no khlo sakata. So with Shalom Ahalacha, when you'll have Ahalacha, you'll have your tent, then you'll have Shalom. Without that, one has no Shalom. Says Yeshua ben Alevi, anybody who knows that his wife is God fearing and he's not together with her, he does not remember her, is the euphemism that's used. He is a sinner. As it says, Fiadata Kishale Mahalacha, you should know that your tent is peaceful and then Viadata, you should know her. Now, says Yeshua ben Alevi, a person is obligated to uh, remember his wife at the time that he's traveling, that is the night before he leaves for a trip. When he's departing from home, he must. Uh, be with her as it says now other say comes from a different um, pasuk where it says that Chava was told that you will have your desire you will long for your husband it teaches that a woman longs for her husband at the time that he is departing so says the Gemara, what do I need two psukim for? I already had one. So the says that the second one is to teach me that even if it's Samach Levesta, even if it's close to the time that she usually becomes a Nida, where generally it's forbidden to be with her, it is permitted if he's being Yotza Lederach. Now what is called Samach Levesta? What is that? How long is that? It's time period. The says that's an Ona, either a day or a night, whichever half, 24 hours, whichever part of the day she's usually going to, she's scheduled to expect her period to arrive. Says so Gemara, this is only true if he's departing on an optional trip, but Dvar if he's departing to do a mitzvah, he's not obligated to, lest the mitzvah distract him from his uh, marital obligations, or lest his marital obligations distract him from doing the mitzvah the way he should. Says so Gemara, a brisa, somebody who loves his wife should love her as himself, somebody who respects his wife should respect her more than himself. Rashi explains that a woman requires more respect than a man. So somebody who fulfills this, he loves his wife as himself. He respects her more than himself. And he leads his children, his sons, and his daughters along a straight path, and who marries them off close to their appropriate age. About him it says, Viadata ki shalom alachi. You will know that your tent is peace. Someone who loves his neighbors, and someone who is Mekarev, he draws near his crow of his relatives, those that are near to him, and someone who marries his niece, his sister's daughter, and someone who lends money to the poor at the time that he needs it. About him, it says that he helps treats those that are close to him. About him, it says, Oz Tikra Vahashem Yane Tishava Vyomer Hineni. He'll call out to Hashem and he will answer. He will Scream and he will say, Here I am. That's following Psukim describing that you did the Chasadim that's mentioned earlier and say for Yeshayo. So there you see that somebody who fulfills this has those Zuchasim.